In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we have the introduction to the book in which Solomon writes in verse 1, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There in verse 2, the word vanity or vanities appears no less than five times. And this phrase, vanity of vanities, this phrase would go on to be used in this short book some 37 times. This idea of vanity, of everything in life being meaningless and empty, is essentially one of the key themes of this book. The word vanity means essentially emptiness, something transitory or unsatisfying. And Solomon, who was the richest man who ever lived, Solomon, who was the most wise man and probably one of the most powerful men who had ever lived up to his time, was determined to search out the meaning of life, to try to discover the purpose of life and to try to discern the best way to live. And as wise men do and men who love learning do, he essentially conducted a number of experiments, social experiments you might call them, in which he tried a variety of things to see what was satisfying and what was not. In verse 12 of chapter 1, he says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. This idea of grasping for the wind, you can feel the wind, right? As it passes through your fingers, can't you? You can feel it, yes? You can feel the wind as it blows across your face and as it whips through your hair. You can sense it, you can smell it perhaps, you can certainly see its effects, but you cannot grasp it. You cannot hold the wind in your hand. It escapes whenever you try to do so. And meaning and purpose and satisfaction are just like that. It's vanity, Solomon says. And he explored just about every avenue one could think of. He tried foolishness. He tried wisdom. He tried productivity and building great things. He tried searching out knowledge. He tried uh, the folly of wine and women and, and, and entertainment and all of those things. And at the end of the day, he found them all unsatisfying. He found them all empty. He found them all to be vanity. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. In chapter 2, in verse 12, we read that he turned himself to consider wisdom and madness and folly, and to compare those things. For what can a man do who succeeds the king? Only what he has already done. Then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. So, He's not saying that all things are equally vain. There are degrees of vanity, to be sure, and wisdom is preferable to folly or to foolishness. Uh, he would also go on to say that the house of mourning was better than the house of mirth, right? Which seems counterintuitive to us. But he says here that the wise man's eyes are in his head, in verse 14, but the fool walks in darkness, so yes, wisdom would seem to be better, and yet look at what he says at the end of verse 14. Yet I myself perceived that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity, for there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As a fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me, for all is vanity 
and grasping for the wind. So he acknowledges that wisdom is better than folly, and yet the fool and the wise man come to the same end, don't they? They both die. And when they die, they can take nothing with them. So all of their wisdom, all of their labor, all of their accomplishment ultimately was for nothing. Now Solomon does come to some conclusions as he talks about this thing of living under the sun. He's speaking of the natural life. He's thinking of life without taking into account the reward that comes from loving and serving God. He's looking at just the natural living, the natural life that a man might have, and what is the best way in which to do that. And he does come to a conclusion. Even though it is all vanity, he still comes to a point where he says, yes, it is all vanity, but if you're going to have to live in this vain world and live this vain life, there is a way to do it that is preferable to other ways. And he makes that point in chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 9, he says, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. I know that nothing is better for them, so nothing is better for mankind than this than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Amen. So labor and work, and then enjoy the fruits of your labor. The privilege of enjoying the fruits of your labor, that is a gift from God, Solomon is saying. And the best thing we can do is to do that to work at whatever it is that God puts in front of us to do, and then having labored to enjoy the fruits of that labor. But he's speaking very temporally. He's saying the best we can do is just to enjoy that moment, because if we look at it in the light of eternity, it's all fruitless. It is all vanity. Finally, in chapter 12, he comes to the conclusion of the whole matter, and let's look at that together. The wisest man alive writes this book and we find his words in the last chapter to finally come to a conclusion that we can sink our teeth into. And here it is. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light of the moon and the stars are not darkened. And the clouds do not return after the rain. These verses paint a picture of old age. They paint a picture that describes to us the character of growing older. And Solomon is saying, listen, remember your creator now in the days of your youth, while you're young, while your body still functions the way that it was designed to function, while you still have the strength and the energy to actually serve the Lord in a meaningful way, he's saying here. Again, verse 2, While the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few. I love that line. He's talking about your teeth. Basically, he's saying when you stop being able to chew because all your teeth have fallen out. Remember your creator in the days before you lose all your teeth. And those who look through the windows grow dim. He's talking about losing your eyesight. And when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low. In other words, when your hearing goes away. When one rises up at the sound of a bird. Isn't that something? You rise up at the sound of a bird, but all the daughters of music are brought low. In other words, you can't hear well enough to enjoy the sound of music. And yet you sleep so lightly that even the sound of a cricket wakes you up. And so he's describing this plight of growing older. Also, they are afraid of height. Well, why are they afraid of height? Why are people, as they grow older, afraid of heights? Because if they fall and break a hip, that's it. You're done, right? Especially in this day and age when Solomon is writing. Also, they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way. And I love this beautiful verse here. When the almond tree blossoms. Do you know what that means? When the almond tree blossoms? I grew up in the central San Joaquin Valley out in the middle of 
of all of those blue diamond almond orchards. How many of y'all have eaten blue diamond almonds before? Well, I've been to their factory and I've driven through their orchards and I've seen their trees in the springtime when those blossoms are in full bloom. And you know what color they are? They're white. They're as white as snow. So when he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the almond tree blossoms, he's saying before your hair all turns white. That's what he's saying. So remember your creator in those days before the almond trees blossom and the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. For a man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about in the streets. In other words, listen, remember your creator in the days of your youth because the day is coming when it'll be too late for you to remember him because you will have died. And these next few verses are all metaphors for death. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel is broken at the well. Those are all again pictures of death. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of the making of books... There is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Listen, when we set our eyes on the things of this earth, then just as Solomon said, everything is vanity. But if instead we heed his advice and remember our creator in the days of our youth, when we, then we have the hope of a great reward for our service. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, I think, is a wonderful companion passage to this passage. In Colossians chapter 3, we read, If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Why? Because all the things that are below are vanity. Because you can't take any of the things that are below with you, but our home is in heaven. And that is where our reward is. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In verse 16 of the same chapter, Paul writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And here in verse 17 is where Paul and Solomon agree. Solomon said it very well, and Paul is saying it even more beautifully here when he says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then in verse 23, he says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Solomon said, whatever you find to do, do it and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Eat, drink, and be merry because that's the gift of God to you, right? But Paul takes it a step further and he helps us to see the divine perspective when he says, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. When we recognize that the things that we do on this earth, whatever they may be, whether it's preaching a sermon or leading worship or vacuuming a floor or fixing a computer, when we recognize that whatever it is that we're doing, whatever it is that our hand is finding to do, that the end result of that is not just to eat, drink, and be merry, but rather that the end result of that is that we bring praise and honor and glory to God, then suddenly it's no longer vanity, but it has an eternal 
purpose and an eternal value. Amen? So whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Amen? Let's pray.